Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight at our TACTA monthly presentation. My name is Roseanne Hassett. I'm the executive director of the American Civil Defense Association, which is TACTA. Tonight, our presenter is Sharon Packer, and we will be discussing post-event survival. Sharon is an expert in nuclear, biological, and chemical shelter design. She has been on the board of directors for TACTA for over 20 years, maybe even over 30 years. Our presentation will be about 45 minutes long, and then we'll have about 15 minutes for questions at the end. So please hold off on your questions until that time, and we'll let Sharon um, get through what she'd like to say. So with that, I will turn the time over to Sharon. Thanks, Roseanne, and thank you for coming. I'm hoping somebody's watching that news and will let us know as things happen if we should stop. Whenever I give a presentation on weapons effects or sheltering or anything that suggests a nuclear event, without exception, I always had someone say, I'm just going to go stand underneath it. And they seem to believe that no one can survive a nuclear exchange and that the dying process would be so horrible as to justify suicide. Well, I read the end of the book, and I'm sure most of you read the same book, and life doesn't end that way. If a nuclear event can't be survived, then it just won't happen. However, if it is survivable, then it just may happen. So what if we survive? Let's assume it happened. What if we do survive? Many people, in particular those living outside the area of primary, tar primary targets, will survive the immediate effects of a nuclear weapon, but then because they haven't made the proper preparations, they succumb to the aftermath. People prepared to survive a nuclear attack are prepared for most any other disaster. So I'm directing this discussion to survival after a nuclear event. <clears throat> All preceding staff lessons in the TACT Academy should be rolled into this lesson. The TACT Academy is free to everyone and is available on the TACTA.org website. And we're assuming that you've made proper preparations against nuclear war and that all of you have a basic understanding of sheltering, survival equipment, food and water supplies, emergency sanitation, winter survival, cooking, alternative energy sources, and fairly good understanding of survival without power and normal infrastructure capabilities. So the principles of protection, and you're all familiar with those, is time, distance, and shielding. The time distance and shielding concepts work in our favor. Shielding takes precedence during the first two weeks while time is progressing. So we should remain in our shelters for at least two weeks. That's because a seven-fold increase in time results in a tenfold decrease in radiation levels. So after seven hours, the time of detonation, then uh, we get a 90% decrease in gamma radiation. After two days, another 90%, and after two weeks, another 90% uh, decrease. So um, we know that this decay is for gamma radiation only, not alpha and beta. Alpha and beta persist for a much longer time, and we'll discuss alpha and beta, beta later in this presentation. Gamma will only be an issue if there are ground bursts. Fallout from air bursts is minimal. Steel shelters with arch roofs can easily survive 50 PSI. We'd expect that blast levels, even at ground zero from an air burst, would not exceed 50 PSI. In a one and a half mile radius from ground zero, radiation from neutron activation could persist beyond the two week period. If you're within that area, you can either choose to remain in your shelter until further decay takes place, or when it's safe to do so, you can travel to a safer area. If you are that near to a primary target, make sure that you've prepared a secure, safe destination with shelter and supplies to facilitate all members of your group. <laughs> Radiological defense manuals published by FEMA suggest that after leaving the sheltered area, we can begin the process of reconstructing our lives and decontaminating our live living spaces. Hosing down or sweeping driveways and sidewalks, plowing and scraping radiation from the garden areas, vacuuming carpets, washing clothing in a washing machine, and you'll notice my two little question marks. So let's do a reality check. We at TACTA understand 
that even in a limited exchange, there could be a great loss of power uh, by EMP. It uh, seems most likely that over there will be no water in our water hydrants, no gasoline for our cars or tractors, no power or water for our back vacuums and washing machines. If there's a limited exchange or a small terrorist attack after leaving our shelters, we should evacuate the area and leave the decontamination efforts to the trained military experts. In a full-scale exchange, we'll be left on our own. We'll need to do the best we can. Make sure that you wear a mask. And I always take a mask in my car. I keep my uh, raincoat in my car. Wear protective clothing before making any decontamination to contamination efforts. And so if you're on your way to your shelter and you get a little radiation, it's not going to be a, a huge uh, issue, but uh, take those uh, precautions. Beta contamination can cause burns like sunburn and inhaling the dust will cause internal damage from both beta and alpha. And before re-entering your shelter or your home, brush the dust off of your equipment and clothing and wash exposed areas of your skin with soap and water. Whoops, sorry. So um, we previously talked about the levels of radiation that are survivable without hospitalization and a level under 150, can you see my marker? Yes. Okay, a level under 150 rads in a one week period is said to be survivable without hospitalization. And uh, if the hourly rate does not exceed 10 rads per hour at any time during that week, the weekly accumulation will most likely not reach the 150 rad level. And so in a month, you won't exceed the 200 level and in four months, the 300 level. So you shouldn't have to receive, uh, you shouldn't receive, have to receive hospitalization. Um, that 10 rads per hour is extremely important. So just keep that in mind. Heavier doses of radiation can be survived as well, depending on the person's physical condition prior to the incident. Areas of the body most at risk are the bone marrow and uh, the lining of the intestinal tract. So the symptoms, and I think most of you are probably aware of these, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, dizziness, fatigue, that would be symptoms of some smaller levels of radiation sickness. Symptoms of anxiety, anxiety fear, and grief. Well, they're all the same. Those symptoms are exactly the same as the symptoms for radiation sickness. And don't assume the radiation sickness if these symptoms persist for a while as they may just be the result of emotional trauma. Treat the symptoms as you would other gastrointestinal disturbances and seek medical help if it's available. It, it would seem likely that there would be mass evacuations from areas of high fallout accumulation. Homes in low blast regions could still be used. Um, Plastic and stable guns should be used to repair windows and doors. Heavy canvas tents, such as used by the military, would be useful, and they be, would allow us to use a wood-burning stove. Uh, people who camp and have the needed camping supplies would be much more likely to survive. Most underground shelters would not need much additional heating or cooling. Shelters described in Chapter 3 of the TAPT Academy could be lived in indefinitely. Building materials could be scavenged from damaged homes. Construction will only be possible if tools, not power tools, have been stored in a safe place from the blast. Uh, we need vitamins, minerals, and medicines. Thyroid blocking agent, TBA tablet, should be started as soon after the nuclear attack as possible and taken for 90 days. And that is, it, you know, when the elderly maybe wouldn't be so much uh, concerned, but, but the young people should be taking the TBA. Purchase the TBA and consult your physician now for proper dosages for you and your family. And uh, people with thyroid problems may not be able to take TBA. Therefore, make sure your physician is aware of any thyroid irregularities you may have. The thyroid is always looking for iodine and cannot distinguish between pure iodine and the radioactive isotope. TBA fills the thyroid with healthy iodine and prevents the uptake of radioactive forms of the isotope. The thyroid Thyroid will only accept iodine in certain forms. TBA is formulated with potassium and the proper isotope of iodine. Don't take iodine internally in any other form. TBA is a medicine and has some side effects. TBA should only be taken in the event of a nuclear 
disaster. A deficiency of vitamin C could cause symptoms of scurvy within four to six weeks. Store a year's supply of vitamin C as well as other multivitamins and minerals and purchase your vitamin C in the crystalline form so you have the long-term storage. Use sprouted seeds or beans as an expected method in providing this vitamin. Instructions are given in the book, Nuclear War Survival Skills. Note the list of medical pharmaceuticals and over-the-counter supplies suggested in the TACTA Academy are, are uh, I can't remember the chapter, but they're there and, and it's a really good list. Gardening. Well, people in low fallout areas ha that have received no blast may have opportunity to cover small plots with plastic before the fallout begins to arrive. And if you intend to garden, store large rolls of plastic. People living in areas of low fallout accumulation may be able to plant crops even the next season. Fallout does not penetrate the top layers of the soil unless there's been heavy rain during the first two weeks. Small plots of land could be scraped of the upper few inches of contaminated soil and planted. The contaminated soil containing the fallout should be moved away from the garden area. It seems unlikely that there could be any large farming activities for some time, however. Uh, storage of non-hybrid seeds is extremely important. Hybrid seeds will not produce reproduce quality fruit. Uh, seeds last several years, and you have to store them in a covered airtight container, and we suggest you put them in a cool, dry area. Don't plant calcium-producing plants such as broccoli and cauliflower. Some plants producing calcium will take up radioactive strontium-90 because of its chemical, chemical similarities to calcium. If we eat the food containing the radioactive strontium, the strontium will be deposited in our own bones and our teeth. Liming of acid soil uh, will reduce this uptake. We can plant things like potatoes, apples, tomatoes, peppers, sweet corn, squash, cucumbers, and uh, because these are have low calcium content and they will be taking it up. Uh, farming implements should be stored in a safe place and protected from blast. Crops which are in the early stages of growth in heavy fallout areas may absorb radioactive materials through their leaves or roots and will be difficult to decontaminate. If possible, animals should be put under cover before fallout occurs and should not be fed contaminated food and water. And um, if you could, if you have a, a barn and you, and you have your hay, you should stack the hay on the sides of the barn, uh, leaving space for the animals on the interior. A lot of the barns have kind of a pointed roof or a rounded roof and the, and the uh, fallout will blow off and, and be washed off. And so you have all of that protection on the sides. Uh, farm animals can be slaughtered if they don't appear to be sick. The bones and eternal organs, however, should be removed. And uh, that's internal, not eternal, should be removed and disposed of before cooking the meat. The animals may have been foraging on plants and grasses contaminated with strontium-90. Strontium-90 looks chemically much like calcium. Uh, the bone cannot differentiate between strontium and calcium and will be deposit and will deposit the strontium into the bone. And if we cook the meat with the bones, the strontium will then be deposited into our own bones if we eat that soup. So, so uh, eat the meat, but not the soup. Uh, and don't make soup on the bones. I mean, you can make soup off of the meat, but, but uh, don't cook the bones. Eggs from poultry can be eaten. Um, the, if the bird doesn't look sick, you can you can eat the poultry, but remove the bones and organs. Strontium will persist in the bones again, but the the uh, the chemicals the strontium will come into the shell and not into the egg itself. Hunting and foraging, and I'm going along really good here, so we'll have plenty of time I think for for uh, questions afterwards. Uh, deer and elk and other wild animals can be eaten if they don't appear to be sick. Uh, discard the organs and the bones of all animals before you cook them. Uh, fish from streams and lakes, such as trout and perch, can be eaten. But don't eat the catfish and, and the bottom feeders. So eat anything that's, that's swimming on top, it's okay. Uh, bottom feeders, such as carp and catfish, should not be consumed because those particles have mass and they, they will filter down onto the bottom of, of the lake or stream. Uh, many people are confused about the kinds of food that can be eaten after a nuclear event. 
fallout from uh, the explosion consists of tiny particles of dirt and debris fused with fission, fission products. Alpha and beta particles in the fallout can persist for long periods of time and will contaminate all food to which it comes in contact. On the other hand, gamma radiation from the fallout is not a particle and does not contaminate food. Gamma radiation is actually used to purify food. So a lot of times in our stores, we see uh, foods that, that say they have been uh, 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 They've been purified by gamma, and I'm never concerned about eating those. Our challenge will be in differentiating between foods that can and cannot be cleansed and decontaminated of alpha and beta particles. So most gamma radiation will not persist beyond two weeks after the nuclear event. Uh, <clears throat> foods to eat from the garden. So if, if there's been, if this is at harvest time, uh, we can go out and we can... Uh, uh, harvest uh, any of these foods that have hard skins and uh, they need to be decontaminated before consuming uh, by washing and uh, any of the exposed parts and removing the outer leaves and then peeling. And uh, FEMA materials have stated that most vegetables and fruits that can be washed and peeled, peeled can safely be eaten. So if the nuclear event were to occur at harvest time, you could still harvest smooth, hard skin vegetables and fruits, uh, such as all of these listed. Things that we can't really eat. Well, raspberries, strawberries, peaches, cauliflower, broccoli, things like that. They're real hard to wash. Anything with uh, uh, bump, uh, that bumpy skin like cauliflower, uh, we couldn't we couldn't wash, wash that, that effectively. And raspberries, strawberries, peaches, uh, it would be very difficult to wash properly. Uh, if fallout contamination is suspected uh, in your packages or your canned food, uh, it should be wiped or washed before you open it. Uh, meats and dairy products that are wrapped or kept within closed showcases or refrigerators will most likely be free from contamination. Um, refrigerated uh, Food should be eaten first, and then foods from the freezer as it thaws, and then packaged or canned foods after that. Uh, water is the most important element of survival. So once the short-term storage has been depleted, we'll need to forage for water. The water can be found in hot water heaters and in wells and hand pumps, which will pump from as deep as 200 feet, are uh, available uh, through Am Amish catalogs. Emergency water clarification, filtration, and purification methods were discussed in a previous lesson. Take particular note in that lesson of the expedient water clarification method utilizing that, uh, that clay method where we have a, a bucket and we put in clay and carry cloth and gravel. And then as you pour the water through that, uh, the ionized particles are picked up by the clay. It binds to the radioactive, uh, radioactive particles and it leaves the clarified water ready for purification. So that's a two-part process. We have to purif uh, purify it after it has been clarified. So use your Im imagination and be creative when foraging for water and purchase a good water filter. But that's going to be our limiting factor. Water, if you're, if you're sheltering any place near a stream, or, or if you have a well, then you have a great advantage, but uh, water, we, we will have to forage for water. Uh, we can't overly express the importance of storing a year's supply of food. Uh, the basic storage items, as suggested by Dr. Robinson in our book, in our TAC manual, are easily and inexpensively purchased. Use that method as a basis for your storage. So we're, uh, it, we're encouraging people to put away such things as rice, and wheat, and beans, uh, those basic things, but we still have to have um, oil. And, uh, and I found that uh, the best oil has the longest shelf life is, is actually uh, um, uh, coconut oil. And uh, it has, uh, uh, if it's of the, the correct kind, if it's that virgin oil. And I buy mine at Costco. I bought at Costco, I bought a couple of years supply of it. But it's very important that we add oil to our supplies. And then as we can afford it, we should be adding freeze-dried foods such as uh, you know, fruits and vegetables and even the, the prepared foods are nice. But, um, but those basics, rice, wheat, and beans and oats and corn, dried corn, 
they're fairly inexpensive and we should buy them and, and store them and, and uh, put them in plastic buckets. So the, the uh, then 10 gallon or five gallon buckets will protect them from the mice. Um, emergency sanitation, uh, we look at uh, toilet facilities, um, garbage, rubbish, uh, Sewage could be disrupted. It could be that the sewage will um, back up into our homes because uh, most of us don't have gravity fed sewage. So they're pumped by um, uh, by those uh, big pumps that will affect be affected by EMP. So if you can, uh, you should try to get to a plumber and have them put that backstop into your your sewage so that it doesn't back up into your home. Um, so it's critical that procedures be established to safeguard proper health or disastrous results can be experienced. Uh, proper management of toilet facilities during times of emergency may have a greater effect on our health than any other single element of sanitation. Uh, bacterial infections such as typhoid and dysentery can be just as devastating as the earthquake or food that caused uh, or a uh, flood that caused the emergency. Uh, and so refer to lesson seven on water and sanitation for further details about toilet facilities, but garbage uh, and rubbish need to be separated. Um, they, uh, the garbage breeds bacteria, perhaps insects and small animals, uh, rubbish trash will not. So garbage or any mixed refuse uh, containing garbage must be carefully stored and handled if odor and insect nuisances are to be prevented. So since rubbish can, alone is fairly easy to dispose of, garbage should be kept separate from the trash. And so that lesson number seven, water and sanitation should be reviewed for information on garbage, trash, and sanitation methods. And so make sure that you have um, other facilities for your, your toilet use, um, uh, there's some really nice toilets that are available, such as uh, dry toilets, just and nothing more than a than a bucket and, and a toilet seat. And buy uh, those heavy. Um, I've just bought a, a lot of those heavy plastic liners for the dry toilets, and so you would use those and then just uh, 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 take those out at, at, and store them until you can take them out. And if there's any way you can do it, if you have ground that's easy to dig, you should maybe dig uh, a little area in your yard and maybe fill it up with sand or something that's easy to dig out so that you do have a way to dispose of the uh, of the uh, solid waste in your toilet and of garbage. And then if you can burn your, your rubbish. Um, communications is going to be so important and, and um, Amateur radio um, in that 40 to 80 meter range is is so valuable. And, and I know we have some amateur radio uh, specialists that, that are with us. I'm, I'm just a baby amateur radio user. And I know Bill Perkins, uh, I'm sure he can help you too. But we've got a great um, article on amateur radio that we've been uh, putting into um, the TAC to um, uh, into our journal of civil defense. And so that's just got about everything you need to know. But but the two meter range has to have a, uh, um, what do we call it, um, relay station. And so that relay station is not going to survive an EMP. And, and so two meter then doesn't uh, do us any more good than a CB or a walkie talkie because two meter radios then will become line of sight. But if we have a 40 to 80 meter range radio, then we can reach and then it, it bounces off the, the uh, stratosphere and, and we can reach all over even into Europe. And that's where we would be getting any communication. So if you have, any way of, of organizing a CB or a walkie-talkie group, and they can get into someone that has an amateur radio, then they can get back to these people with walkie-talkies and the line of sight radios and give all the information they need. And so that's what we're doing right now in our communicate in our community. We're organizing uh, so that we can have walkie-talkies and we have a good amateur radio. Uh, that is within distance of our walkie-talkie so that we can get that information. Um, uh, let's see. 
and we know that blasts and EMT uh, would damage many radios and and uh, power most probably would not be restored for long periods of time. Um, some small communities, in particular those on hydropower, could restore their power earlier than others. Uh, so, um, hams typically keep spare parts and would have knowledge of EMP protection and uh, would put them back on the air before any of the commercial units. So uh, if you know a ham, try to keep in contact with them and see if they won't work with you with your walkie talkies. Um, several days after an EMP interference would be minimal and radios <clears throat> featuring AM frequencies should pick up stations as far away as Europe. So make sure that you keep a radio um, that uh, a battery powered radio that you can reach out. Of course, that's just one way. You're just listening, you're not talking, but it would be very helpful to get that information and keep that radio wrapped in uh, aluminum foil, protected against uh, uh, the EMP. It's probably okay because the antennas are small, but keep the antenna down and, and we only have one chance. So wrap it up in aluminum foil when you're not using it. And, and that would be uh, a, a really good source. Um, Underground steel shelters are often good, maybe not perfect to have a EMP protection. And most radios require outside antennas to read, uh, receive properly from inside steel shelters. Uh, assuming your shelter is connected to the grid, you should receive a, single, a signal by holding a transistor radio, this is AM stations only, near a power cord, even after the power grid has failed, because that power cord has got such a long antenna itself and if it's connected to the other power lines then we should be able to receive a pretty good um, uh, frequency uh, many people have the cb capabilities uh, some of our ch chapters currently exercise a monthly exercise and uh, uh, then we can transmit such things as radiation levels and 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 other information that would be really important to our members uh, heat and light, um, oops, too many. Sorry, <laughs> now I've gone through the whole thing and I don't know how to, there I go. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> heat and light. Um, diesel generators would be useful until the fuel has been depleted. Uh, a battery system with solar panels for recharging or a small hydro generator would be a more practical solution for long-term recovery. Uh, Wood or um, coal burning stoves and fuel storage should be part of every home's emergency systems. Uh, coal stores will be, uh, if placed between a straw blanket and covered with dirt, it'll last a long, long time. But please note that wood burning stoves may not withstand the heat generated from coal. So if you have a wood burning stove, don't use coal in it unless it says, it actually says that it can be used with coal. Um, and it'll be printed on the, the stove in your uh, documentation. Um, I go in the wrong direction still. So um, transportation. So fuel would be difficult to replenish. Uh, vehicles with computerized ignitions could be damaged by the electromagnetic pulse. I know a lot of simulations have been made, but we don't know if, if the level of simulation is what they would actually be using. But uh, those simulations indicate that uh, older cars manufactured before 1965 and, and newer cars after the year 2000 uh, may remain functional. And so if your vehicle doesn't start, uh, try removing the battery cables for a few minutes and then reattaching them. Uh, this may reset the computerized ignition, and uh, you may want to store a wrench of the correct size in your car for that. Uh, bicycles, wagons, horses, carts would become extremely valuable. Um, and refer to the lesson on alternative energy, energy sources for further information on transportation. Um, so let's see, let's look at security. Not enough can be said about security. Uh, cities may release their prisoners from jails and prisons to fend for themselves. In fact, that's the plan that I've heard that they would use. 
Uh, dogs may form roaming packs looking for food and livestock. Uh, your security systems will most likely not function. A family dog may be your best alert system. Uh, be prepared to guard your homes and supplies. There's safety in numbers. Good neighbors who've made proper preparations would be a great source of comfort and protection. Um, our journal this month, uh, our Journal of Civil Defense has been dedicated to emergency alternative shelter systems. And take note on that front page, uh, places where you could uh, uh, survive in alter as an alternative shelter in, in buildings and, and the protective factors that you get. Uh, we hope you'll read it carefully. It's a wonderful source of information on survival skills. Uh, another a wonderful uh, source is uh, the book we've mentioned before, Nuclear War Survival Skills, and that's also available on our CACTA website. And it gives instructions for six different expedient shelters and uh, directions for the construction of an inexpensive fallout radiation meter, all kinds of good information. But uh, it looks like I did really good and and uh, and we'll have plenty of time for, for questions, but uh, I know that that the survival will take a long, long time, but our greatest goal must be to bring back a feeling of community. There must somehow be an organized effort to bring back constitutional law. A civil society can only be restored if we develop, the develop feelings of fellowship and service to others, and that would be my wish and my prayer for you. So I'll turn it over now to questions and comments and discussions. Feel free to raise your hand and we can um, help you get unmuted or you can just ask a question. Hi there, wonderful presentation. I just wanted to say my name is Katara. Um, just reaching out to ask a question about law enforcement. So we are going towards this martial law act or what is it like every man for himself? Um, we should stay united but how do we keep that justice and service as law enforcement should we listen to the law military or what well and and that's that's a real hard that's a real hard question and hard. it almost depends on your community in some communities i think we would be more uh, trustful than others when we already have a community that's that's pretty law abiding but um um I just, I don't know that in a full scale event, we would even have the ability to have martial law. I think it would almost be anarchy. And um, I could be wrong, but um, uh, the, the people will be so hungry that they'll, they'll be forming uh, mobs and, and they'll be looking for food. And, and uh, so uh, we'll probably need more protection than what we have just within our own family. So that's gonna be the hard one. And um, and if we do have a community that we trust, then then we you know we need to 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 get the help we can get. But uh, that's kind of got to be a an individual decision. Hey, this is Travis. Can I make a comment? Please. Uh, yes, I'm in Texas, and the sheriff elect of the county I'm in uh, introduced. Uh, he he offered a meeting about this and introduced your organization and is encouraging that we organize in community groups. And a lot of the sheriffs in Texas and other states in the country have openly stated that they will protect their citizens and that their citizens are first. So it depends on where you're at. If you're in a large, shall we say blue state or blue city, uh, you're gonna have a different response from the administration of law enforcement, but most of your law enforcement officers, especially in the red states, are gonna take care of their community as best they can. But a lot of us see that organizing as you are discussing and this organization discuss is very important to make that successful. That's what I got. Thank you so much. Hey, Sharon. Um, would you like to start your video now? If I can. Let's see. Looks like I can. <laughs> there I am, I think. There, there we I go. Am. Great, thank you. Um, we have a hand up by Dean B. Dean, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, how do you know how many RADs you've received? 
Sharon, did you hear that? No, I didn't. I didn't understand the question. Yeah, there, yeah, there was uh, early on. You were talking about uh, keeping track of how many rads you've received. I, there, there may be a right. simple uh, uh, answer to this in a book somewhere. You could just refer me to that. Okay. Well, of course, without a, a metering device, it's going to be hard to know. But uh, if you have a dosimeter and those old FEMA dosimeters, you know, they're fairly inexpensive. If you have to buy a new one, they're a little more expensive, but they are available. In fact, we have some really fine dosimeters now on our tap to website, but um, you have to keep track and, and the bookkeeping is going to be just critical. So um, especially in those early hours of an event. So um, in many places, for instance, where I am, I'm probably a day, a day and a half away from any uh, fallout that would come. It would come in from California, most likely. And so that first seven hours, that first 90% probably has already decayed. And so uh, we're looking then at another two days before we get a real decrease again. But keep it, keep watching on your dosimeter. And if after an hour you're receiving more than 10 rads, then you want to make sure that you're putting in more shielding around your shelter or finding a better place within that shelter, adding shielding wherever you need to, to keep it under the 10 rads per hour. Because uh, as, that, uh, as that week progresses, it should stop, it should start declining. But if we can keep it below 10 rads, then the accumulation at the end of two weeks should not be more than the 150 rads. And then we would be safe to, to, to say that we would not need hospitalization, but we want to keep it to the very minimum that we can. But it, it can only be shown uh, with a meter. So, uh, and also you look outside, um, you can see accumulation of fallout. And if there's no dust outside, you're most likely not having uh, heavy fallout. So you will actually see it in the form of dust. But if you can get a dosimeter or if you can if you can have communications with someone that has a dosimeter, then you can uh, see those uh, levels. But keep track of them and uh, keep track daily, hourly for the first few days and, and then keep track on that dosimeter and then recharge it back to zero and, and, and uh, look again. But we should be able to have dosimeters that read up to 200 rads. So, um, uh, make sure that you're keeping uh, a good record. So we Thanks. do sell dosimeters on our website at tacto.org. And also in this, uh, in our current Journal of Civil Defense, we have a penalty chart on page 29. So you can refer to that for those numbers that Sharon mentioned. And in fact, in the past several journals that we've published, we have penalty charts. So look for those. Are there any other questions? One more. Go ahead. You mentioned uh, a few books, uh, Surviving... Uh, Nuclear War Survival Skills. That one and then the manual. I, I, any other, I guess those are on the website. Any other books uh -huh. you want to refer to? Yes, uh, they, they are on uh, attacked as uh, 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 a store as well. And you probably can get them on the website as well. Um, but uh, they have some good information. And, and FEMA put out, as, especially in the early years, uh, they put out a lot of information. If you can get any of those old FEMA documents, training documents, they have a lot of good information. So um, one of the other books that Sharon mentioned was the TACTA Academy, and that is also on our website under resources. You can download the TACTA Academy for free, a chapter at a time, or you can purchase the book. Any other questions? I couldn't hear that last comment about the TACTA manual. Could you repeat that, please? The TACTA Academy is on our website and it's under the tab resources on the navigation bar. It's right towards the top. And you can download each chapter for free or you can purchase the book on our It's website. about 150 pages and, and uh, um, we have all of those subjects that we were talking about today that can be reviewed.
Thank you. Any other questions? You mentioned an Amish catalog with pumps that can pump from 200 feet. How can we find that? Uh, uh, that's on uh, the line uh, on uh, online also. Um, I have one, but it's fairly old. But they have a lot of wonderful things in that Amish catalog of uh, manually operated items that are so important. So it's always on my wish list to you get just the search items from the Amish on. catalog. Uh, yeah, okay. just A M I S H Amish catalog. So uh, I'm sure Le it's Lehman's Lehman's dot. Yeah, uh, Lehman. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, is it L E H? Yeah, it's L E H M A N. Lehman. Good, Lehman, uh, I've got a question. Go ahead. Hi, this is Neil. Sharon, I've got a question. Uh, there was a discussion about radiation, and my question is how to or what to do to protect against radiation. So the only thing we can do is, is uh, to provide the shielding overhead, and so... Um, I know, I happen to know that you have a big empty swim pool in your house <laughs> and, and uh, you have a very high roof. And I was thinking that a really good place, it, it, it's protected on all sides, would be inside that pool because the water is gone. And so you wouldn't be getting any radiation from, from outside from the surface. And the, the uh, tall, tall part of your house would, would be... Uh, uh, that radiation would be uh, uh, blowing away because it's uh, fairly peaked. But uh, but in our in our tech to, uh, uh, journal of civil defense that's just coming out this week, have we got it yet, Rosanna? I don't have mine, but I uh, mine just arrived yesterday. Okay, so, so in that journal arriving. of civil defense, should be uh, then, then we have all kinds of expedient shells sheltering that, that uh, we're going to be looking at for protection against radiation and, and again, uh, doing all the things we can uh, to protect internally from alpha and beta, because gamma is just an issue for two weeks, but alpha and beta is an issue for a long, long, long time, longer than we'll live. So we have to be careful what we eat and, uh, and protect the internal parts of our body. I have a question about eating. Um, you mentioned something about um, chickens, and um, I remember you said that we could eat the eggs, and um, I think you said something like if the if the animal looked sick, you could still eat the meat, but not the bones. Did I hear that right? Uh, no, if the animal does not look sick, okay. if it if it's sick, then don't slaughter it. But if the animal okay. looks healthy, then you can still slaughter that animal and. Uh, and and but you strip the meat from the bones and you strip the organs and only eat the meat. Don't, don't even boil the bones because the strontium will will uh, be into the bones and the organs are the cleansing uh, part of the of the animal's body. So we want to just do only the meat. I have a question about that. Um, when it comes to the animals that are sick, can they? It, like contribute if they scratch you or bite you is there some sort of an infection that they can pass i know radiation kind of acts differently but is that something we should worry about uh we won't uh, catch radiation from them but uh if they uh certainly if if they're ill they're going to be uh more likely to get infections and sickness of other kinds disease of other kinds so uh, so we would be uh, have to be careful, but they're not going to. We're not going to catch any radiation from them. And one more thing: I live in a very, very windy city or state, I should say. Um, does radiation affect cities with wind differently than you know stagnant air? I would be wearing a mask because that radiation, uh, the the dirt, mm -hmm. the fallout. Uh, is is light and it'll be blowing around a lot and so you don't want to breathe it because the alpha and beta is only a problem to us if it goes internal so we don't want to breathe it in uh, we don't want to you know we want to protect our skin uh, we want to wear long sleeve shirts and long sleeve pants and and uh, and uh, if it's uh, you know, if there's still a lot of fallout after that two or three weeks and the gamma radiation is real low, then 
then we still want to protect ourselves with uh, maybe a, a raincoat and a rain hat and, and uh, keep that fallout off. But windy uh, cities, you know, wear, your, wear those good masks that we had during our COVID-19 issue. Any more questions? Uh, I have an idea that uh, maybe I'll bounce off of you guys, but you know, if we're looking for uh, protection from fallout, it's protection from the radiation, not a blast shelter. And you've seen these shipping containers that uh, go overseas. They're nine feet tall, I think eight feet wide and 20 or 40 feet long. You know, if you take uh, concrete masonry units, solid block units that you can get down at uh, Lowe's or Home Depot, you can stack that up beside them to a, a height of seven feet and you've got your protection, all you need. Oh, I forgot to tell you, you put an A-frame roof above that so that the fallout slides off the roof and comes down to the side and then the block protects you from the radiation. I don't know, is that? Uh, yeah, and now uh, to get minimum uh, protection at the 15 PSI level, and again, we're not talking about blast protection, but at that 15 PSI level, the radiation, um, we expect a certain amount of radiation. We can get that without blast, but um, they're, they are suggesting 40 inches on, on any shelter that's above grade, 40 inches on the sides and, uh, uh, I can't remember if it was two feet on the top or something like that. I can give you, maybe I could look it up fast. But, well, uh, you, don't, you don't have to worry about the top because your your shelter goes above you. All you care, if you got an A-frame roof above you. If it'll blow off, but if that A-frame, you know, if it's, if it's holding radiation, you still have to have uh, some protection up there. But maybe with a metal roof or something that would be real slippery, or if you could maybe wash it off, I don't know, but there still will be fallout that's hot that's coming through. But it's it, that is a good plan. Now, I wouldn't bury one of those containers because the, no, 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 no. Yeah, the metal just uh, does not react well to the dirt and it isn't uh, solid enough. But if you could put 40 inches on the sides, then you're going to get some real good uh, radiation protection. But of course, once you have 40 inches on the sides, you've also got some blast protection that's just, uh, build into the fact that you've got all that good radiation protection. But, but you want to make sure that you also have, if you can get a 90 degree angle going in there, the most of the radiation will come through the entrance. So if you can get a 90 degree turn, every 90 degree turn attenuates 90% of that gamma radiation. So in your, uh, in your little shelter, uh, if you don't have a 90 degree turn, then you want to make sure that you've got 40 inches on uh, the inside of your door as well that you you stack up and and uh, and that you get uh, try to get an emergency exit as well but um, but that's kind of the the rule of thumb we go by for Swiss shelters that we need uh, about forty inches to get the minimum level of of the of medium radiation but lightweight you know the real light radiation that wouldn't be necessary if if you look at your primary and your secondary targets and you're not downwind of a of a large primary target like in St. George where I live I don't I can't think of a single primary or secondary target that's within my range um, and uh, uh, the Air Force Base that's out south is uh, is quite a long ways and and it isn't uh, I I'm sitting uh, in a good location from that so we would get light radiation but and and no blast, so so you know you wouldn't need the whole forty inches. But look at your look at your targets, weigh your targets. I I can see I did not do a very good ex job of explaining what I was talking about. Uh, of course, you have to have ninety degree uh, angles, preferably two of them. But uh -huh. if you take a, a shipping container, like I said, uh, nine feet tall, eight feet wide, forty feet long. Put an A-frame building above it with a metal roof, which is smooth. Uh, fallout uh, particles are about the same consist con consistency as salt. And the angle of repose is 34 degrees. That means the angle it'll assume naturally. 
So if you have your roof at 45 degrees, you're definitely going to slide off. And from the sides of the shipping container out to the A-frame, which goes all the way to the ground now, that's where you would put your radiation shielding. In my mind, using the concrete metal blocks would mean that I could use those after the emergency is over a month from now, and they might have utility as a building material. Sure. Yeah, but you still so, have to have, you know, a fairly good amount on that ground level. Um, so, so good, no doubt, no doubt. Uh -huh. But it only has to be about seven feet tall. Uh-huh. Yeah, and I think it sounds like a great way plan. around it and, uh -huh. and you're protected. Yeah, I think it sounds like a good plan. Thank you. Sharon, in the um in the current Journal of Civil Defense, you mentioned the magic 10 rule. Can you tell everybody what that magic 10 is? Uh, that And that's just what we were talking about. 10 rads per hour is the magic 10 rule. So if you can keep your levels during that fallout time, if you can keep your levels below 10 rads per hour and you watch your dosimeter, then you won't accumulate more than 150 rads in a week. And if you don't accumulate more than 150 rads, then you should not be hospitalized. You should be able to survive that. That's the magic 10. And if you have over 10, then you have to add more shielding. Add more shielding so that you get way less than 10 the next hour. <laughs> so you got to make it up. So if you're starting to get above 10, then start putting more shielding or else find a better place in your shelter. Okay. You, you spoke of you're not in an area with uh, targets down in St. George. Are you aware that Putin published his 14 targets in the United States? And for example, Hill Air Force Base was clearly one of them. Uh, yeah, and that's way north of us. Well, I know. I'm just saying that uh, uh -huh. whoever is here intact, uh, yeah. uh, you know, good old Vladimir gave us a list yeah. of where he plans to attack. Yeah, he he does, and and we consider that. And Airport Number One is a fairly good target as well. So that's a bit of a worry for Salt Lake because it it's a um, it's a refueling uh, the the refueling bombers are there, so that becomes a primary target. Sharon, there's a question on the chat. Um, someone is wondering what the difference is between a Geiger counter and a dosimeter. Okay, the dosimeter is like the odometer in your car. It tells what you've accumulated. The Geiger counter will tell, like your your uh, uh, your car, uh, uh, it tells you how many miles per hour you're going. Well, the Geiger counter tells you how many rads per uh, per hour you're getting, and and uh, then uh, you just watch that. But they're much more expensive, the Geiger counters, and they have to be calibrated all the time, so they're not as useful because uh, you don't know if they're calibrated correctly. Where a dosimeter and you have your charger, you calibrate that every time you charge it and you calibrate it yourself. You don't have to send it away. There may be some Geiger counters that are self-regulating, uh, but uh, but the, the Geiger counters that we had in FEMA weren't. We had to send them out to get them calibrated. Will a dosimeter show accumulated radiation, or do you have to recharge it every day? Well, it'll it'll if you never charged it and it starts at zero, it'll it'll show you accumulations up to two hundred rads. Then you have to recharge it. Okay. But I'd be watching it more carefully than that and keeping track because if you're getting up above that ten rads per hour, then you want to make sure that you're. You're uh, managing your your shielding. Okay. Any other questions? We have about five more minutes. Can you mention um, repeat the fact about the vehicles? I'm so used to thinking about old school cars to run to, but you mentioned something about even um, after 2000. Can well, we the simula uh, the simulations, and again, I don't know what level that simulation was tested. Uh, it may be that the EMP will be uh, higher than that level, but the simulations that were done earlier, they showed that the uh, the later model cars had enough shielding that they restarted every time there was one 
that they had a little trouble with. I think I think it was a Buick. But as soon as they took the cables off of it and let it discharge, and you can you can kind of touch those cables together to get a little spark, but let it discharge for a minute. That'll be a long minute for you. <laughs> then uh, then put them back on the battery and see if your computerized ignition will restart. Thank you. Any more questions? I'd like to ask a question. Go ahead. Uh, what are your thoughts on the pipe after doomsday? That was like the original big one on the subject, but it's very dated. How do you think it's held up? I, I didn't quite hear the he last part. Bit. He was asking, what are your thoughts on the book, Life After Doomsday? Did you read that book? I, I did. It's been a long time. Um, and and uh, I don't know. Some of the books are written in order to, to, uh, to make nuclear war so unpopular that we would insist on having all nuclear weapons destroyed. <laughs> but uh, Life After Doomsday, Stay, you know it. We just don't know what it's going to be, uh, and hopefully, uh, you know, if we can, if we can do those things that we've been taught and make the preparations that we have, and and if we can uh, gather around a, a a fairly friendly community, then then we can do it. But um, uh, large cities are going to have a problem, and I think. It, wasn't that life under after doomsday? Wasn't that taking place in a city or someplace, and they were going from place to place? Or was that another one? Uh, life after doomsday was, as far as I know, the first like technical perspective where they studied wind power, uh, like global wind, um, general wind currents, and uh, it was the latest and greatest with government speculation on stuff like that. But I think it came out in the seventies, so it's very dated by now. So. That's I, why I, I, was um, I know that they talked a lot about solar winter and uh, and they did a lot of uh, uh, computerized uh, versions of what would happen. I, I think there probably would be some uh, uh, smoky atmospheres for some time, uh, but I don't think that I, I really don't see any evidence that we would have a nuclear winter like they've talked about that. Um, it, it wouldn't be e easy. We'd sure have to, to have some good preparations to survive it. What hey, do Sharon. you think the light? Oh, go I'm ahead, sorry. sir. Oh, hey, Sharon, that's good. You look great this evening. It's Peter's. Great to see you. Hi, Peter. Um, uh, yeah, I was curious, you know, our, our dear but dearly departed friend, Kirk Paradise, uh, he trained several of us to be uh, fallout shelter monitors uh, when he was alive, and they he showed me that they have an entire room full of the full civil defense Geiger counter sets with the 717s and the 715 and the uh, the dosimeters. But my curiosity is, you know, have they forgotten that, that he did that? I mean, no one's called me or touched base with me, with especially with everything that's going on. It's I try I find it kind of curious that no one's reached out to us for that. Uh, so, are those uh, meters available, or is it the training you want to talk about? Um, it's, it's the, uh, training or not so much even the training, but those of us who are already trained, we have not, nobody's reached out to us and no. go the way the world. Yeah, you know, it's frustrating, that. isn't it? Because there's a lot of good information out there and people that understand and, and yeah. they don't know the questions to ask. That's the worst of it. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, uh, understand enough that we can ask intelligent questions about it, but they, they just don't understand what even to ask. So. Well, I'll try to reach out to them uh, tomorrow, uh, send them an email or something, and then uh, wait and see what I hear, see if we can maybe get some of those uh, kits. But the do the uh, meters are hard to come by now, uh, but maybe we can. But meters, again, they have to be calibrated. And um, uh, the nice thing about the meters is uh, they also have a beta wand that can read the beta. So if you were looking at food that you were worried about, and we're wondering if it needed to be decontaminated. But the general rule is if it's hard skinned, you can wash it 
And if it's soft skinned and fuzzy, don't try. So contaminated food, I think it's fairly easy. I, I don't think I'd, I, I have a beta wand, but I don't think I'd be using it because I wouldn't trust uh, any of the food outside. I'd wash it and peel it anyway. But um, but that monitoring, uh, you know, we, it, it, it's something that we have to do, but with a dosimeter, it's pretty easy. You just keep track. And if someone, you know, if we only have one dosimeter for the, old, the whole group that's being sheltered, then it's easy. But if somebody's going out and and uh, uh, then it becomes a little more difficult if somebody has to go out for something, but but we want to keep track as best we can. I know we're running over time here, but I, I think we all kind of want to know your personal opinion since you know so much and you've been educated on so much. We've all seen the world die practically three or four times, but how are you feeling about current situations and our preparation? I mean, do you sleep well at night knowing or are you kind of like, oh, this is really more serious than any other time in, in our uh, past decades? How are you feeling well, about that? I, I didn't sleep a whole lot last night. I was up until awake until about two worrying about, you know, the things that we're talking about today. But um, I, I, I've been concerned um, because of just where we're sitting right now with the Passover and then we had our eclipse and I just thought what a perfect time for Iran or for any of the terrorist organizations to say, wow, this is the time we need to do something. And it appears that they have. Um, so I've been a little nervous about the time, but we've always got to be watching. And uh, uh, it it's there's so much unrest right now, and especially with the Israel issue. So I am I when you say nervous, um, I I there's not a day that I don't do something further to prepare. So uh, I don't know that nervous is the word, but anxious maybe. <laughs> What have, have I done everything I should? Have I got everything in order? And uh, and I live a ways away from my shelter, so it, it would take a little bit to get there. But uh, expedient sheltering where I am is going to take high priority if it happens suddenly and out of the blue. But uh, I, I think we live in a very dangerous time. Stay safe, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Great questions. Is there anyone that has a final question you'd like to ask? I know you have a you might have a lot to ask Sharon since she she is an expert. Did we cover everything? I wish we could cover everything, but <laughs> I would just scratch the surface. <laughs> so true. All right. Well, we'll end it there then. Um, well, thank you so much for coming. Appreciate your support. Yes. Thank and you, everyone, for coming. Just keep, keep preparing. Be thank well. you, Sharon, for all of your hard work and your preparation. We really appreciate you. And um, we hope that everyone can get prepared as well as possible and utilize the things that we have on our website. Feel free to... Um, Send an email if you have any further questions. You can email email us at info at tacta.org. And if you bear with me for a minute, I forgot to uh, mention our disclaimer. So I have to read this before we close. So nothing in this presentation should be considered legal, medical, or financial advice. The opinions of the viewers can differ considerably and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of TACTA. So with that, we'll end here. Thank you so much for joining us and stay safe, everyone. Thanks, Bye. Roseanne. Bye.